So it's Tony Gonzalez from Made in Metal. And today we are going to talk to Joelin Turner, who is uh, releasing a new album. So, Joe, how are you? I'm doing well, Tony. Thank you. How are you? Fine. Good. You're Good. So we are here because you are going to release your new album called The Belly of the Beast via Mascot Records. So tell right. me, is there a special meaning on the title? Absolutely. Uh, belly of the Beast is a phrase that's used. Uh, it's not a new phrase. Actually, Anthrax had a song called Belly of the Beast, and I think Steven Seagal had a movie called Belly of the Beast. But it, what it is, is any time that, in this case, it's a phrase used about the beast system. The beast system is the government control of finance, religion, economics, medicine, etc. Uh, things in our everyday world. So. When you're in the belly of the beast, you're under complete control, or at least an attempt at totalitarianism. So that's what this means, that belly of the beast, that we as a population of humanity on this planet are trying to be taken over. Joe, I never imagined a lot of things. Now, I never imagined that you were aware of the anthrax song I never imagined to see you with that look. I never imagined, and I think that nobody in this planet could imagine that you uh, have working with Peter Tagren. Tell me, how did you meet him and why did you decide to work with him? Yeah, it's all pretty surprising. Well, I met Peter about five years ago and um, actually the short story is that He hired my band, Joel and Turner Band, to do a party for his brother, Tommy. It was a surprise party, 50th birthday. And uh, we started talking, you know, eating, drinking, talking, partying. And we got around to the conversation of maybe doing something musical together. And we kind of laughed at first and said, wow, you know, it's like two different worlds. But then we said, maybe it could be interesting, you know. And we started talking further. And on the way back to the train, down to Stockholm, he gave me a track. He said, why don't you write and record your vocals and send it to me to this track? So I did. And that song actually became Don't Fear the Dark on this record, the exact vocal and all. Um, and he loved it. So we knew we had something going. So after a while, I went to Sweden to his studio, The Abyss, and we recorded two more songs and wrote two more songs right there and then. And we knew there was a, a chemistry, you know, a magic that, that was happening between us. So we were, we were set on the fact that, yeah, we could do something like this. We can make a bridge between hard melodic rock and modern metal, industrial metal, a bridge, something that is crossing both genres, maybe even more than two genres, but we would make some type of combination um, between these two forms. And we kept to that vision. Anytime we went too far left or too far right, we brought our production and writing back to that vision. So that, that's how it all really happened. Um, what, what happened after that was that we both went on tour. I think he was on tour with Payne at the time. And I was on tour with Joel and Turner Band. And then the pandemic hit. And that's when everybody got locked down and uh, restricted. So we had to do things by Zoom, Viber, WhatsApp, computer files, et cetera, just like everybody else was doing, you know, writing, writing at home, but together, you know, far apart. And um, I'd say once the restrictions had start to lift, we came, we came to the studio together and finished a few vocals, fix ups, and that was about it. And we were done. I think that the bridge is done with your new song. Yeah. Yes. Maybe this was the reason why the people, no, maybe the people expect a, a regular Jolene Turner album, energetic hard rock, heavy metal, uh, catchy songs, remembering your glorious career. And it will be difficult for some uh, people to face your new movement in music with this dark CD. 
What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. I think some, some people won't understand it. I think uh, they expect the, the love songs and possibly the, the, just the melodic hard rock. But I think a lot of people can cross over on this record. Uh, I have a lot of my old fans that love what I'm doing because although this is more on the metal side, it's more on the, the industrial metal side, it's melodic. We didn't lose melody. We didn't lose choruses. It's still, even though I'm using a harder voice, it's still Joel and Turner. So uh, I kept a lot of my fans, I think. Maybe you lose a few, but I think you gain more. So it, it, it's a balance, really. And, 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 it's, and, and Tony, as far as the dark, it has to be dark because these are dark times. This, this, you know, art is a reflection of society. It should really be a mirror to reality. And the reality is right now that it is not all hearts and flowers. We are in some dark days here. So I'm, as an artist, I'm just more or less pontificating about what is happening around us, inside and outside. So that's why it's, it's also dark. In my opinion, I agree. With you, I agree with the CD. I enjoy it a lot because uh, you are, even when you are now 70, 71 years old, mm -hmm. you are not finished. So you have nope. a long career. And what I think, what are you going to do forever? Singing Deep Purple and Rainbow songs? No, this is a very yeah. good movement, very brave yeah. by your own. Thank you. You declare. Thank you. You're welcome. You declare in a previous interview that you are now in a transition state. Is the belly of the beast part of this transition? It's a major part of the transition. Over the last five or six years, things have changed in the world so much. People have changed. Too many things to mention have changed. And change is a transformation. And I have absolutely transformed into another form, I think, as you can see, and as you can hear, and as you can witness. And what it is, is that if an artist doesn't change, I think he runs the risk of just stagnation and repeating himself over and over. And I think that's death for an artist. I, I mean, I always, I'm not liking myself to David Bowie at all. So please don't anybody lose their shirt over this. What I'm trying to say is Bowie, whom I love, Um, he he was a changeling. Every album was pretty much different. I mean, from Rebel Rebel to Let's Dance, but he was still Bowie. That's an artist. When an artist grows, transforms, and changes, um, when you when you run the risk of repeating yourself constantly, uh, for me, not only does it get old for the artist, but I think it gets old for the fans too. It's very stagnant. I bring to this conversation. Uh, the Deep Purple and Rainbow, because I read that last year on Brave World, you declared that you were tired of singing Deep Purple and Rainbow covers. And I, yeah. I, I am agree with you. So you did it at Sweden Rock in 2019, where you only think your own material. And tell me, are you thinking to play on tour the songs from Beauty and the Beast? I want to play all the record, all, all 11 songs from the Beast album, but I also, as I say, salt and pepper the set because it needs to be a little longer with some songs from my solo albums, which were written in the same vein, in the same style, only I need to heavy them up a little more. If you, you know, one, one fan comment was very intelligent. He says, Joe's not really different. He's just, he's always done this, but not in totality, not in a whole album. For example, on the Slam album, I have songs like Evil, Dark Days, Eye for an Eye. On, uh, I believe it's The Usual Suspects, I have uh, Blood Money and these other these subjects, Babylon on Holy Man. These songs fit with my theme today. These songs are exactly what I'm talking about today. Because one thing was for certain, that in the book of Revelation, in the Bible, it prophesied 
that the belly of the beast, that the beast system would happen again, and it would try to take over the, the humanity with an authoritarian control. And I was writing about that then, but now I am completely on tune with it, with a full album. So I've really not changed. I've just increased my outlook about this. Do you know who are going to be the musicians who are going to work with you in the future? For example, well, is Peter Tagren included? Well, you know, Peter and I, first it was a solo deal and Peter writing and producing like me, right? And then we started to say, well, maybe we could do a band. And we even were toying around with band names and things like that. And then after a while, he just started to see his schedule fill up. And he said, you know, I, I, I can't commit to a band because I have hypocrisy and pain. I have other productions for bands I have to do. I have other projects I have to do. He said, so how can I possibly commit my time uh, when I have all these things juggling all these balls, so to speak? And I said, I totally get it. You know, I, I totally understand and respect your position, Peter. I, so that's not a problem. Um, I really hope that at some point, though, uh, he can join us on stage. And uh, I don't know, for a few gigs, for maybe as long as he can. It would be fantastic. Uh, but as far as the other musicians, um, I have people in mind. For example, uh, the, Love Magnuson from Dynasty is playing lead guitar on this album for the most part. And uh, I just love that band. They were Joel and Turner backup band. So in one way, I'm thinking that these guys on their off time can back me up. But it's really too early to tell. I'm putting out feelers. I'm talking to musicians. Um, but it's so early to tell because, you know, we don't even know what 2023 is going to bring yet. I mean, during the pandemic, this whole industry got destroyed. And we're just starting to come back. And I can hope and pray that we are going to be out there doing concerts and, uh, and things will return to normal. But you never know. I, you just don't know right now. The world is in chaos. So it's a, it's a precarious time. But I can tell you one thing. 2023, March, that's what I'm planning on, starting around March, because I do not like to tour during the winter. I have seen too many accidents happen, too many buses tip over, too, just too much danger when you're on the black ice. You know, the snow, the rain, the black ice. Not a good time uh, for touring for anybody. I was there, for example, in a short story when uh, Metallica, way, in the, way back when, was opening for, for Rainbow. And um, they, that's when the bus tipped over. We were about 45 minutes behind them. And we drove up and saw all the police lights and we saw the bus and you know what happened. So, no, the winter is not a very good time to tour. So I'm trying March 2023. I was thinking of the, the musician from Dynasty. Yes, like you tell me. But I was thinking that maybe uh, the bass player, Ken Sandin, who has played with you a lot of time. And even, yes, I was thinking on of Jorge Salam, the, the Spanish guitar player. Possible? Yes. Yeah, that's possible too, because Jorge can cut this. I need two guitar players for this because it's uh, it's a heavy guitar-oriented album, so we need the backup and the lead. But uh, absolutely, Ken, Jorge, there's a lot of guys out there, you know, and, and some of them are, are working, um, and I don't want to take bread out of their mouth, but absolutely. Besides, these guys are friends of mine. I love these guys. So, uh, you know, it would, be, it would be great to tour with them. I, I was just in touch with Jorge, as a matter of fact, uh, last week. So, but uh, when I was thinking of the musician, I thought that now the problem is maybe the keyboard player, because uh, in, the, in the CD, there are a lot of choirs, a lot of sounds. So, wow, how can we do this? Uh, I'm going to ask you about some uh, songs. Uh, if you agree, for example, you told me at the beginning of this interview that there is still you in the CD. Yes. For example, when songs like Belly of the Beast, Black Sun, and even Tortured Soul have this song have some rainbow 
in by masking traces, you the, the problem is that your voice is unique and wherever you think, you bring your own personality. Yes, but tell me about the first songs of the record. What we tried to do with all the songs, with the whole record, was stay within the bridge, stay on the bridge between Peter's career, my career. I, I've been in Deep Purple and Rainbow, so yeah, and I have an identifiable voice, true. But also Peter's influence is huge on this record. Mm. He, he created the platform, which I kind of skate on, you know, I kind of walk on. So you're going to hear, he was very mindful of my path. You know, with the heavy B3 on Black Sun, for example, you know, it's very purple-esque. Um, some of the chord changes. So he, he interpreted part of my sound and past, and I was understanding where he was going, what I had to do to heavy up the voice a little bit. But we always kept it within sort of the bounds like this, on this road. We never tried to go too much this way or too much this way. We kept it right here. So you're going to hear those influences because this was obviously, you know, where we were, we had respect for each other. And this is where the bridge, this is where the bridge is built between those, those genres, between those careers, shall we say. Yes. And uh, I think that the, the song that has the more influence from Peter and maybe his sadness, maybe he's a very happy guy, but in some music we feel the sadness. Is a, a, the last song of the CD, Requiem. Please tell me, tell me, how did you approach to a song like Requiem? Well, Requiem, honestly, uh, is not something that the, the music was written by a friend of Peter. Peter said one day to me, he goes, you know, there's a song, we had 10 songs, We needed an 11th song. And he said to me, you know, we have this, my friend uh, who works in his studio, I'm getting mixed up because I'm trying to put it in chronological order. Uh, Jonas uh, Kilgren, he works in the back studio. Peter's got a pretty big front studio and he's also got a small rear studio. Jonas is a producer, guitar player, writer. He's in a band. And he wrote a track that Peter loved. So Peter played me the track. He said, we never were able to write a lyric and we were never able to write a melody over it, but we know you can do it. So I took the track home and immediately I heard Requiem. I just heard it. It sounded just like what should be almost a funeral. And, but a funeral of death? Well, the death of love. That's the way I interpreted it. Requiem is a very heavy, beautiful, really goth kind of sounding tune with, uh, with, with the organ, the heavy organs and Mellotron and heavy guitars with a heavy message. It's about a man who's lost through his own fault, the woman that he's absolutely adored more than anything in life. This was his true love. And he let it slip through his hands. He obviously made mistakes. And now he's paying for it while he, he just laments. So Requiem is, is the death of love in his heart. He doesn't ever know if he could love again, as the lyrics say. You know, broken dreams, broken hearts. Um, all, the, all the dreams of men, you know, through, through, through time and time again. You know, he'll never recover from this. So it had to be. This, this huge chorus, and, and, and I might add, by the way, on the chorus, we brought in the guys from Sabaton to give us that big sound, you know? And they were very kind, great guys. And they came in and, and, and did like the, the, the Requiem and they did some of the OOOs on the record and, and so on. So it was great fun to do that with them. But uh, yeah, Requiem is a big sound written by Jonas Kilgren and me, so. And Peter also, he, he, he produced it, so it's going to have Peter's sound on it. Maybe you recorded last year, but the CD was uh, released at the beginning of the year. The CD called Legacy, a tribute yeah. to Leslie West. When yeah. you appear singing two songs and Bobby Rondinelli 
was also involved. This made me ask you, how are the relationships between you and the rest of the musician from Rainbow right now? Not, well, not, I, not I, need to mention Richie Blackmore, but the rest. No, I, I, I have no problem with anybody. Um, I wouldn't say that we talk all the time because we don't. Every once in a while, I'll get an email, I'll, I'll send an email, but, but that's it. Um, it's kind of like when a marriage breaks up, you know, most of the times these, these bands, they just, we all go our separate ways and, uh, you know, we don't really make phone calls. It's not like that. Mm -hmm. I talked to Bobby maybe a month ago, okay, about something else completely different. And uh, I've been in touch with, um, no, it has to be about two years ago. I was in touch with Rosenthal and uh, a couple of, and Bergie and a couple of people. But uh, it's not like we're super, super close friends. When you're in a band, you're traveling 24 hours a day, seven days a week with these guys. And uh, sometimes when we finally split, you know, we just send Christmas cards. <laughs> but I, I also ask you, because we interviewed uh, Bobby Rondinelli last year, uh -huh. and uh, we both remember that it was him who goes with Richie Blackmore to see you the first time when uh, they were thinking to uh, hire you from, from Rainbow. And I remember that when the years are passing by, these kind of memories, uh, you feel with some nostalgic uh, move or something that everything, when, it, when this is the star, all the stars are beautiful. Then the situation are getting a uh, torn sore. So tell me about this. What do you remember? Absolutely. Um, I know that they they went to a club, I think it was in Long Island, and I think it was called My Father's Place. Uh, at least that's what I remember. And um, I guess, you know, as Richie Wood, he'd hide in the shadows out of sight because I didn't know they were there. You know, I never saw them. And my band Fandango was playing at the time. And then I guess uh, maybe a couple of weeks later, I got the call from uh, Barry Ambrosio. I guess it was Bobby, Barry, and Richie that, that went to the club. And um, I got the call from, from uh, Barry, actually, who was Richie's personal at the time. And uh, that's, that's when he said, you know, do you want to come down and First of all, he said, I'm standing next to Richie Blackmore. And I thought it was a joke. I really did. I thought one of my friends was putting me on, you know. And then finally, he put Richie on the phone. And Richie said, no, it's me. And I'd like you to come and audition. So I took a train out to Syosset, at Long Island, in the studio where they were. And Roger Glover was there. And Richie was there. And um, we had slight conversation. And they said, get in the studio and sing. So I started singing. And... I just saw them nodding their head as an approval. And then they said, can you sing to this track? And it was I Surrender. And so I listened to it twice. And I said, okay. And I said, can I change a few things? They said, do what you want. So I sang it my way. Changed a few turns and melodies here and there, which later Russ Ballard really appreciated. He said, you know, he really enjoyed what I did, my phrasing, et cetera. So um, I made the song work because Russ never thought it was going to be a hit at all. But it turned out to be, I think, number three in England. So And it did quite well in the rest of the world. So it was a, really a kind of a dream come true story, you know, that there I was on a, in a small apartment in New York City looking for, you know, playing with Fandango. But the band was breaking up because uh, for many reasons, for many, many reasons I won't go into but uh, yeah, and, and Bobby was doing the drums on that and the rest is history. But I have great memories, great memories of the fun we had. It was a really good band, Rainbow, really good band. When the people talk to you, they always remind your work with Rainbow and Deep Purple and Richie Blackmore. But now I would like to talk to you about Mother Army. It was a studio, a studio project where you worked with Jess Waxon, Bob Daisley, Carmine Apis, Isley Dunbar. You record three albums. The band was successful only in Japan, maybe maybe USA, I, I'm not sure. 
But tell me. A little bit. Yes, but tell me. Well, so are you thinking? I, I, the most underrated band in the world, I think. Yes. Those three, those three albums are absolutely amazing. Yeah. We did all that. We did all that stuff live in the studio, live. Yeah. I I went into a booth to sing it. Uh, Bob and and Carmine or or Ainsley they played live in the studio and Jeff at the same time. This was a real band. We broke time signatures and everything. I mean, it was unbelievable because it, it and and the albums. If you listen to them, they sound like that. They sound raw. They sound real. Yeah, we have a few uh, overdubs, polishing things, but other than that, it was raw and real. Um, Fire on the Moon, for example, I can remember doing that. We went into a much harder direction after Planet Earth, and um, that's still an amazing album. Uh, the songs on that. In fact, maybe that's one of the songs I'll do on my set because it deserves to be heard. And then what happened was Nirvana came out and the Seattle Sound came out and it buried the classic rock idiom. And uh, we got lost in that. But the people who know Mother's Army love Mother's Army. Yes. So, so uh, maybe, maybe can you think of rescuing a song from the future now that you are more focused on your own career? It would be really, really good. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah I think so. I think yes. so too. You know, I'm in touch with Bob Daisley four times a week. We email all the time, back and forth. We send different uh, YouTube videos and different things so that we're interested in. So I'm always in touch with Bob. He, he's still a very close friend. That, that's the difference between a lot of other guys and bands, but he's one of my really close friends. So, yes. uh, you know, it's, it's like we always talk. And actually, Jeff just... Uh, I've been, we've been in touch with Jeff as well because Jeff just said that we have three or four tracks that he found in his studio that have never been released. And uh, we have this dialogue now going on about uh, can we use these tracks? And he said, yeah, they're, they're in great shape and that all we have to do is, is kind of tweak them up and mix them. So we said, okay, you know, let's, let us hear the tracks. And we'll give the okay, and then maybe we'll have uh, Edo or somebody release them because I'm sure I know the songs. They're good songs, and it's they're good performances. So there's four, three or four. I'm not sure of the number, but I I know that there's they're unreleased Mother's Army tracks. Let me tell you that looking for information, I read that uh, you were in Foreigner, the band. To me, was yeah. a surprise. Two weeks. Yes, <laughs> yes, two weeks. But did you have time to play in concert with them? No, 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 no. It was all it was all in the uh, rehearsal studio. In other words, I got accepted into the band, but I had some arguments with the uh, very arrogant manager. Oh. And uh, yeah, and you know, because I don't look. Nobody has to push you around. This guy was he was known to be this way. Bud Prager. He was known for it. They called him the Silver Fox, and he was he was a bully. So I don't take that crap, and I just told him, hey, look, you know, back off. And he didn't like it. Then I heard he made a phone call to Lou Graham, and Lou knew that I was uh, considered to be in this band. So apparently they made a new deal with Lou, and Lou came in. He came back. But then Rick Wills called me, the bass player called me, and said, look, uh, You know, I know that uh, there was trouble with Bud Prager and, and now Lou's back in and, you know, you're a great singer and all, but I've got another offer for you. I said, what's that? He says, bad company. I said, bad company. So he goes, yeah, they're looking for a singer. Now, this is just before they got Brian Howe, right? Mm -hmm. So they were still looking for people. So Brian was one of them and they were going to ask me. But that's when I got the call for Purple. So I said, Bad Company, Purple, Bad Company, Purple. And I just felt very comfortable with Richie and Roger. So I went with Purple. Yes. So when you uh, get in the Deep Purple to recording a Slave and Master, uh, you are part of the 50% of the band, Blackmore, Glover, You with Rainbow. Yes. Yeah. And uh, But however, 
uh, when, when you were there, did you think to, to write songs and, and try to make it different from Rainbow and more Deep Purple, or you don't think on it? What do you remember? Well, I mean, you know, you have four guys from Purple and three guys from Rainbow. How's it going to sound? <laughs> people <laughs> called it Deep Rain. People called it Deep Rainbow, but yeah. really, I think it's a, I think it's a great Purple album because it's a little bit of a different direction for them. But then again, all the people in Rain in, in in Deep Purple always had a little bit different direction. And um, you know, one thing that always bothered me was the fact that they think I'm unhappy with that I'm not I'm so proud and honored to be part of the Purple Legacy they were one of my favorite bands so joining that band and making a great album like Slaves and Masters by the way Richie thinks it is too he wrote about it in an article and um, I think it stands the test of time you put that album on 30 years later now and every song and all the production and performances are amazing. There's nothing wrong with that album. But people don't like change. A lot of people just, you know, well, we want Gillen back and we want this and we want that. Great. But I was instrumental in that. In fact, I'd like to bring up a fact right now, uh, because you're you're you have you're a member of Hush, that in the deep uh, there was an article that was out on some rag zine. I call it a ragzine because uh, it it did not publish the truth. It said I was dissatisfied with Gillen coming back. That is, at, I disapproved or something. Uh, are you kidding? I would never disapprove of that. In fact, I knew about it. I knew that BMG had offered the guys a big deal, a good deal, and that Gillen was going to come back and Richie was going to stay in the band. And Ian Pace actually in an article with Fireworks magazine, and I have the excerpt from the magazine to prove it, said Joe was the glue that held Purple together so we could reform, otherwise we wouldn't be here today. He said, so Joe performed a really great service. And that's what I said in this interview, but this fanzine or whatever, uh, called Fans, Only Fan Star or something, uh, they they said that I disapproved of Gillen coming back. Why would I disapprove of that? Yes. First of all, I knew about it. Secondly, I love Gillen. I had no problem with this. I was in a great band. I was in a legendary band. We made a great album. And I moved on. I got plenty to do. So I, there's one thing I don't like, you know, Tony. I don't like fake press. I don't like it. Because it, it really turns the Purple fans off to me. It makes even my fans think that I'm some very sour, angry type of person. I'm not. This didn't happen. I, I had a great time with Deep Purple. We toured. We've got live uh, videos to prove it. We were a great band. Made a great album. And I moved on. There you go. Yes, but... Maybe you you must understand. For example, Steve, Steve Morse was in Deep Purple twenty five years. And there are people still thinking on Richie Blackmore, so that's life. Or, or maybe the people the the Purple fans are really thinking of a I don't know Matching Head or, or life uh, live in Japan since since like that. I have no problem with Gillen. I love Gillen. I love that. I love Mach Four. I, I I mean you know. I just don't like people writing lies to separate the fans from me. I don't feel that way at all. So I just, that's all I want to say about it. I don't like lies and fake press, yellow press, as I call it. I like people who tell the truth and give the friends and fans that we have the absolute facts. That's it. So that's all I have to say. But now I'm going to ask you. Because when I read that you were working in the past with Billy Yo, Billy Yo, I was yeah. amazed because uh, Billy Yo was in Cuba playing in 1978, and I was there. Yes, brilliant, amazing guy, amazing artist. I'm very, very honored to work with Billy. And you know how I I started to work with Billy because of Mick Jones in Foreigner. 
Because mm-hmm. Mick Jones pr- produced Stormfront, oh. the album. Mick and I became kind of friendly after uh, Lou Graham came back. And, but Lou, M- Mick and I both lived in New York City, so we were kind of friendly and went out to dinner a couple of times. And he said to me, look, I'm doing Billy Joel, and I need strong background vocals, and you're the guy. And I said, I'm in. And that's how it started with, with Billy. And then um, I was in uh, the video with Billy, two videos, and also the Letterman show, which is a big TV show, and, you know, hung around with them for a while. And it was great fun. He is a very funny guy, very clever, <laughs> brilliant artist. Yes. And uh, I imagine that uh, Billy Joel uh, loved New York because, uh, you know, the 52nd Street, Piano Man. Yeah. Uh, and tell me, did, did you share the feeling from the city, from New York, like him? Absolutely. Absolutely. Back in those days, New York's a different place now, but mm-hmm. back in those days, I loved that city. It was just, it really was the greatest city in the world to me. And I've been to many, many, many cities in the world. And there are some really good ones. But New York, so nice, they named it twice. New York, New York. <laughs> it was it was full of, I mean, the, everything. The entertainment, the food, the glitter, the glitz. It, it was New York, man. It, back in the 80s, you couldn't beat it. So I was there when the lights went out on Broadway. Yes. Okay. I was in a studio, I was in RCA Studios with Fandango, actually, and I was playing a guitar, a guitar part, and all of a sudden, the guys inside said, um, we think you're out of tune. So I said, I checked my guitar, and I said, oh, no, I'm in, I'm in tune out here. And they said, all right, play it again. And as I played it again, I saw the lights just flicker a little, like, like this. And that's why they thought I was out of tune because the machine started to slow down. Back then we were using tape, okay? Then the lights just completely went out and it was pitch black. And I remember they had to get a flashlight to get me out of the studio. We had to go down the stairs because the elevators didn't work and we went out into the streets. And there we were on Broadway and 44th Street, RCA Studios. Sixth Avenue and 44th, but then we walked over to Broadway and all the lights were out. The only thing you saw were the car headlights driving and these huge shadows on the big buildings in New York. And it was quite an amazing, amazing sight. Then the lights came on for like a second or two and everybody, the whole city just went, whoa, you know, and then boom, they went off again. And that's the song Billy wrote about. Yes, so, uh, uh, so the, I feel good because when you go out, you didn't uh, were afraid of the blackout. Because when I no. read the news, yes, I read the news, and the people were afraid of the blackout. There were some vandalism, nothing happened. No, it, it, no, back those days, New York, Giuliani was, you know, he cleaned up New York a lot, and the mayor, and um. It was, it was a lot less crime than there is today. Believe me, the crime in New York today is staggering. It's a different city, different leadership completely. And uh, it's in chaos. I have friends that lived it. And they said, we're moving. They said, where are you going to move to? They said, Florida. Everybody's moving out. Because it's just a crime-ridden city now. It's a shame, really, what's happening there. And many places, many places. Taking account, maybe, maybe I, maybe you are American, but but not Italian. Tell me, tell me. Yes, I'm Italian American. Hmm. I was. My parents were Italian. Uh, uh, my grandmother came over from Italy. Both grandmothers and grandfathers came over from Italy, and my mother and father were born in the United States. And then I was born, of course, in the United States as a citizen, and I'm still a citizen, and I still love the United States but I don't like what's happening to it. That's all. Yes, but t- taking account your, your vocal technique and the clarity that you, where you think, you think very clear and everybody understand all the words. Tell me, uh, do, did you have uh, people like Fran Sinatra as a model, role model when you were younger? Yes, absolutely. My father was a singer. Yes? And um, yeah, well, he wasn't professional. 
but he was a very good singer. My mother was also singing. My grandmothers, my uncle played guitar and sang. So it was a very musical family. And I played accordion at seven years old. And then the Beatles came out and I picked up the guitar and uh, the rest is history. Uh, I was always a guitar player first because I love the guitar. I have over 40 vintage guitars right now in my collection. And uh, I became a singer by complete accident. Uh, I was in my local band sing, uh, and playing guitar and singing background. And the singer got sick. And so somebody had to finish the set. So he went on stage and I walked up to the mic playing guitar and singing and everybody came up front like, wow, who is this guy singing? And that's when I found out that I could actually sing lead. So we fired the singer and uh, I took over. <laughs> yes. And that's how it happened. Honestly, it was an accident. But I think that it was the, the destiny or something. I think that maybe, maybe as a guitar player, you won't be one of the best. But as a singer, you are a singer that all the, the metal fans and the hard rock fans will remember for years. Yeah, that's very true. Um, I switched instruments, so to speak. But I have the honor and privilege of uh, playing with Richie Blackmore on guitar. Mm. So I, I feel like that's a real uh, individual effort because, you know, he gave me a silver anniversary Stratocaster scalloped by his own hand. And I played that on stage with him. And then one night he got upset for something and he threw me his white guitar to play the lead on Smoke on the Water. Because, <laughs> you know, Richie had... He was he had he got mad about something. So he walked off stage, went went to get some beer, and I remember playing the lead. And when I walked back to the dressing room, the people were screaming. He said, It did quite well. He goes, It did very well. He said, Well, I know the lead, you know. I practiced it forever. And um people are still screaming. So he he came back on to do the encore, which was great. But it was a very funny moment. So Listening to that story, I imagine, and I, I, I say maybe most of the people that I know, they consider that they are finished. However, you are still trying. Man, tell me, are you going to do this uh, on the last day? You know, yeah, wait till I drop, you know, but I'll be honest with you. I was just reading something about this the other day. Why do people uh, believe that after 50, 60, you're not allowed to do something? I mean, it's not about age. If you still feel good and you still can sing or play well enough, then it's okay. When you can't, then stop. When you can't, stop. Because nobody, nobody wants to, to, to hear you struggle, you know, But if you still have your uh, your chops, shall we say, shall we say, whether it's guitar or voice or whatever instrument you're playing, play on. Why not? Because I never subscribed to the age thing. I only age is just a number to me. If I felt old and I couldn't do it, maybe that's what would stop me. But I don't. I have uh, stopped the bad lifestyle. I became extremely more healthy. Remember, I had a heart attack a few years ago. So I all of a sudden said, hey, wait a minute, you know, I got to clean up my act. So I started eating healthy, exercising more, um, less drinking, of course, only red wine, maybe a few spirits here and there, but not many. I really just enjoy the red wine. I, in fact, I have my own red wine, which I love. And um, that's the secret really is to stay healthy. And to stay young-minded, you know, young of heart, I think. Young hearts, like my song and my solo album says. And that, that's it. And God gave me a gift where I can still sing. So why stop? I still love to write. I, I write songs for other people. Um, this is my life. Music is my life. Music is my purpose. You know, and um, I plan on retiring someday. 
retiring in the sense that maybe I won't be able to sing as good as I can anymore. But until I, until that happens, I'm going to rock till I drop. Why not? Yes. In that sense, you will be a role model to me. Another another role model to me is Clint Eastwood, the, the film director, who is 90 years old and still working, doing movies, making movies. Sorry. Why not? Why yeah. not? He has, you know, as you get older, like ourselves, we have more experience than anybody else. Our experience, our maturity, we know what this is all about. Whatever it is you're doing, you know, whether it's your broadcasting or writing, uh, what, what we know better than most people. So this filmmaker, of course, I mean, you don't you don't stop because you're a certain number. If you can't do it anymore, then you don't. That's that's the secret. Just stop. But if you can, continue. You know, yes. why not? I, I see no problem with it. Um, I have a friend, for example, who's, he turned 55 and all of a sudden he said, oh, I can't do that anymore. I forget what it was. And I looked at him and said, why? You, you're you sick or you feel bad? No, but I'm 55. And I said, so what? It's a number. That's all it is. You know, I, I, there was an old saying that age does not matter unless you're a wine or a cheese. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> right? It's really good. It's really good. It's really good. So, and, I, and we are neither. <laughs> yes. Uh -oh. Yes. Okay. So, and thank you very much for your time, Joe. I enjoy it a lot. I, de nada. Just, okay. De nada. Perfect. Perfect. And uh, yes, I hope to see you soon. I hope to see you next year on the stage. If I don't talk to you before, you'll see me then, okay? Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. I appreciate everything, really. Thank You're you. You're welcome. You're welcome, really. And, and stay on it, okay? Of course. Till the day All I right. Hey, besos. Ciao. Besos. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.